Good afternoon, everyone, and Thierry, thank you for the privilege of continuing the conversation. Uh, our topic this afternoon is vast for 90 minutes, um, inequality and globalization. And indeed, it's a topic that Christine Lagarde and others have called um, one of the most important stories of our time. Unfortunately, um, Madame Lagarde finished her sentence by saying it was also casting a, quote, dark shadow on the global economy. She and others, everyone from Pope Francis to demonstrators in Venezuela, have also um, begun to show us that there are societal implications, ethical implications, um, issues of inclusion, and then, of course, impact on economic growth. So indeed, this afternoon, the conversation is going to go to the economics, but also beyond. We'll look at policy and governance. We'll look at societal causes and consequences. And we'll also look at the ethical underpinnings, or on occasion, absence of ethical underpinnings to the decision making that's landed us where we are. Um, we're going to take a slightly different format from this morning, and um, we've all thought it might be better to shorten uh, the introductory remarks to about six minutes. And we've organized this so that you have a foundation for more detailed discussion to come, and also for your own questions and comments. So we're going to start out with two, um, two series of remarks um, with an institutional perspective. And for that, we have um, uh, Mari Kivanyemi, as you all know, Deputy Secretary General of the OECD and former Prime Minister of Finland. Uh, and we also have um, Cheng Yongri, um, currently Director of the Asia and Pacific Department of the IMF and uh, formerly Chief Economist of the Asian Development Bank. We'll then open it up to some more um, digging into what inequality really means for analytical purposes. And for that, we have uh, Harvard professor Richard Cooper, who has also held an astonishing number of uh, high-level positions in government and outside of government. So it will be both an academic and a real-world perspective. Uh, and then Dr. Il Sakong, um, who, as, you, as this audience knows, um, is chairman of um, uh, the International Committee on Governance, and also um, was former finance minister of Korea. And then finally, uh, Jean Pisani Ferry is going to wind up with some general remarks and the view from Europe. We are going to try to keep this positive. Uh, we're going to look at constructive ideas and policies for moving forward. Um, so with that, um, would you like to get, get us started? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, uh, Chair, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, very important panel. I'm very happy that we are discussing this theme also uh, today and, and in this uh, conference, um, because this is a very important and unfortunately growing issue. And I'm also glad to see that this hot topic has been increasingly studied and taken up by a broad range of actors, uh, as Chair uh, already referred to. But when it comes to the OECD, um, the need to tackle inequalities has really been on top of the OECD agenda for a long time. In 2008, we made a first wake-up call with a study named Growing Unequal. In 2011, we published Divided We Stand, Why Inequality Keeps Rising. And actually tomorrow, we are about to launch a new working paper titled Focus on Inequality and Growth, Does Income Inequality Hurt Economic Growth? And this uh, survey and paper provides evidence that not only inequality is rising, but also that it has an economic cost and affects growth. Income inequality in OECD countries is at its highest level for the past half, half century. The average income of the richest 10% is now 9.5 times that of the poorest 10%, up from seven times 25 years ago. And that is the average when you look at uh, uh, particular countries uh, among the OECD countries like Mexico, the ratio is uh, 27 to one, and then when you go to the Nordic countries, the ratio is uh, approximately seven or six uh, to one. And then when you go to more G20 countries like Brazil, although declining, the ratio is 50 to one. In South Africa, 100 to one. 
Inequality rises also in more egalitarian countries like the Northern Europeans. And some of the most vulnerable groups, such as youth and the poor, continue to fall far behind everywhere. The gap between rich and poor has widened further since the crisis, largely because of large income losses suffered by the unemployed and underemployed. In fact, more than six years after the onset of the global financial crisis, the world still faces a large and persistent jobs gap. An estimated 102 million people remain unemployed in the G20, and many more are unemployed or underemployed in low-paid and precarious jobs around the world. And among the OECD countries, uh, altogether, still almost, we have still almost 12 million unemployed more than before uh, the crisis. So inequality in household income increased by as much in the three years following the crisis as in the previous 12 years. OECD analysis also reveals large inequalities along other dimensions of, of well-being with large gaps between people from different socioeconomic backgrounds in health, education, strength of social connections, political engagement, <clears throat> and sense of personal security. The result is an uneven economic patchwork where some social groups and regions within countries prosper while others fall farther behind. So what are the consequences? Growing inequality comes at an economic cost. Our research shows that when income inequality rises, economic growth falls. Inequality is not only bad socially, ethically, humanly, it is also bad economically. The analysis shows that <clears throat> if inequality increase, increases, at the same rate as of the last 30 years in the OECD, and that means uh, at uh, 10 percent, this suggests a reduction of 7.5 percent in GDP per capita compared with a baseline scenario in OECD countries in the long run over the next 25 years. Another important finding of us is that income disparities at the bottom 40% of the income ladder in particular do hold back economic growth. And the main mechanism through which inequality affects growth is that it limits the ability of young people from poor socioeconomic backgrounds to invest in their human capital and skills. It lowers their social mobility and hampers skills development, leaving aside the potential of this group to contribute to the society and economy. Indeed, as the title of today's session indicates, globalization is usually pointed as a usual suspect when it comes to inequality. But globalization itself does not directly influence inequality skill bias technological changes, changes in employment patterns and working conditions, and a weaker redistribution via the tax and benefit systems are actually the main culprits. But when setting this uh, scene, uh, the question is that how can we address this situation? What should be done? And uh, the answer is that we should deliver inclusive growth. I would like to name some of the policy avenues that we at the OECD see key to fight inequality. First, invest in education, invest in human capital, and this really is fundamental. Governments should make sure to grant access to education for all, including children with the most disadvantaged uh, socio-economic background. And same applies for job-related trainings and lifelong learning. 
which should also include low-skilled workers, long-term unemployed, and the needs, the, the uh, so-called not in education employment or training young people, so that educational policies are really inclusive. And also what should be promoted is upskilling of the workforce, better training and education for the low-skilled and really lifelong learning. Uh, and with the help of this, uh, we could be able to meet the challenges of the globalization. Second, government, governments should look at some other public policies. Reforming tax and benefit systems and government transfers in particular have an important role to play to safeguard low-income households. Anti-poverty programs will not be enough. Other priorities should aim at improving the efficiency and access to public services, such as healthcare, to create greater equality of opportunities. And finally, governments should promote <coughs> employment opportunities, <coughs> which is uh, why a proto-economic recovery is crucial. I think I have already used my six minutes, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Just before we go on, uh, could you comment a little bit further? You've used the terms uh, social connectedness, political engagement, ability to contribute to society. Could you just take it one step further and talk about then the impact on social order? So anything from what we see in Venezuela to the Occupy movements to, for that matter, what we're seeing in Ferguson, Missouri now. Yes, I think that is, uh, those are signs of uh, inequality. Uh, when the society uh, is not able to, to provide really the same opportunities to every, everyone, also to those uh, young uh, children and um, young, young adults uh, whose background is not the best possible. Uh, so I think that, that really is uh, the recipe number one uh, to make sure that everybody has uh, access to, to education. Thank you. Uh, it's my honor to be in this panel with my former boss and uh, uh, my colleagues here. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, and like OECD, uh, at the fund, uh, inequality has become a really, really, really important issue because we also found, uh, like OECD, that excess inequality is very harmful for the economic growth. So, but uh, to differentiate my uh, presentation, let me focus on more on the so some highlights fact about the most uh, recent rising inequality in Asia, and then uh, talk about a little bit more uh, policy options. Uh, before I mention the recent rising of inequality in Asia, let me first emphasize that in absolute terms, Asia is still better than other emerging economies in Latin America and Africa. In every Gini coefficient at this moment in Asia is around 38, which is well below the 54 in Latin America, for example. But what we are worrying about is the rising trend and the speed of the uh, aggravation of inequality problems. In the last 20 years, uh, many Asia in, uh, in Asia, such as especially big countries like China, India, Korea, Indonesia, all observing a really rapid increase in inequality, which is quite different pattern that Asia has experienced in 1960s and 70s. In 1960s and 70s, when Asia Tiger uh, had a very really rapid economic growth. At that time, economic growth uh, came with uh, at least same level of inequality, or we haven't seen the rising inequality at that time. But now, in the last 20 years, Asia had led a, a global economic growth, but with a very rapid increasing of inequality. And uh, uh, as uh, the, my previous uh, speaker mentioned, uh, there are very ironically, we believe that uh, the same factor which contributed to the rapid growth of in Asia, such as uh, technological progress and the globalization and market-oriented uh, reform, all contribute to the rising trend of inequality. Let me give an example. In the 1670s, when Korea has uh, you know, developed our economic structure, we rely on the uh, you know, manufacturing companies, which, own, you know, which hires many workers. So if you go to the car company, semiconductor company around that time, we see many uh, workers are working at the factory. But these days, if you go to in China, uh, and they, they are doing lots of car industry, semiconductor industry, but you don't see the people, you see the machines. So the really capital, you know, the labor-saving technology 
is really one factor. And uh, globalization uh, has now introduced a new trend that the winner takes all, you know, because it's all global competition. The best uh, human capital will capture the, you know, hold the benefit mostly. And then also market-oriented reform and the globalization make, for example, in China, the uh, coastal, coastal area is developing much more faster than the inland and the inland area. So uh, uh, our study shows that uh, to support these views, our study shows that if you look at the labor share of income in the last 20 years, in China, for example, labor share of the income in manufacturing sector declined from 48% to 42% in the 20 years. In India, the, the decrease is much more drastic. So in India, labor share uh, uh, decreased from 36% to 21%. So labor share of the income is going down because of technology progress. And uh, our study also shows that, uh, our study, this one is, uh, to, to be fair, it's an ADB study if I move to IMF. And uh, so that if you break down the inequalities, educational uh, differences, the so-called college wage premium, all these things account about 25 to 35% of the total inequalities. And uh, spatial uh, differences, for example, in China, uh, spatial differences alone between the inland and coastal area can explain 50%, more than 50% of the rise in Gini coefficient in China. So basically, uh, the spatial educational uh, combined with uh, this technology really driving the, you know, this trend, we believe, and that makes the policy options really quite limited and very difficult. So uh, in IMF recently has a paper about what kind of fiscal policy is effective for reducing the inequalities. And we are emphasizing, uh, we generally agree with my pre previous uh, speakers on the general issues, but we, our conclusion is that in general, the design matters. So we all agree on the principle of design matters. Let me give a few examples and we probably need to discuss further. For example, education uh, wage gap is a big issue. So, but if you look at the recent trend, it's a tertiary education and very high education which have a, a really rising you know, premium. So maybe, so far, the education policy in uh, developing institutions focus on the general universal education in primary and secondary school. But that may be very effective in reducing the poverty, but may not be effective in reducing the inequality. So maybe we may need to have a, some kind of educational policy which can support tertiary education of the poor family. So that may be the one option. And then also, uh, in the in order to address the uh, spatial, uh, you know, the inequalities, maybe our infrastructure investment or the, from the public or the international organization may focus more on the connectivity of the center to the more remote area. And then maybe in case of China, the hukou system and there's some constraint about the labor migration may be the major reason for these spatial differences. And uh, if I make just one more uh, examples, then, uh, you know, the, how to address the declining labor share at the time of the technological progress. You cannot prevent the, you know, you cannot slow down the technical progress. But on the other hand, we, our policy has a, some kind of lagging mentality. In the 60s and 70s, when we need more saving and capital investment, government introduced many uh, capital favorable economic policies such as investment tax credit. The major objective was just increasing investment. Maybe uh, from now on, maybe we have to probably introduce some policy which can favor for the employment. So in some sense, it, I do not mean that to give a subsidy for the employment. I mean that, that there may be some uh, distortion which favors capital over labor, and those can be rewinded. So there are uh, you know, many examples, and uh, probably <laughs> the design and how we address these inequalities uh, is very important. But let me conclude with one, one remark. When we say that the inequalities we have to be very careful. It's not for the whole general inequality, or it's uh, more than inequality in opportunities. And the excess inequality is quite uh, detrimental to the growth. But maybe for the low-income countries, at this moment, there is uh, some country which still some kind of inequality is a uh, natural consequence of economic development. That we have to, we should not uh, undermine, uh, downplay that trend too. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. Um, a couple of follow-up questions. Would you have one particular policy initiative you, that you think is the most important or should be the top priority? Um, and then here we are in one of the most technologically advanced countries with companies like Samsung, and you mentioned the downside of technology. Is there in Asia specifically an upside to the technology in, ter in terms of the inequality question? If you uh, ask me what is our fund's uh, general institutional view of how to address this 
uh, issues. I think uh, we have uh, some general conclusion is that uh, maybe transfer policy is much more inf uh, uh, effective than tax policy. You know, tax policy can address many issues, but in general, transfer policy is very uh, uh, you know, more effective than transfer pol taxation policy. And when you think about the policy, when you talk about how to address inequalities, the other objective is fiscal sustainability, right? You cannot just give over all the fiscal resources. So in order to address this issue, thinking about taxation together with expenditure side is very important. For example, if you look at the value-added tax as itself, value-added tax itself is very, uh, you know, not progressive. But if you, given the, some kind of uh, uh, lack of experience and ability to collect tax in many low-income countries, if you introduce value-added tax and use that as a redistributive transfer, overall as a package, they may be more effective. So I would rather uh, not to give more details, but you can uh, you know, go to our web, and then you can see we have uh, some you know, paper on the fiscal policy and inequalities. We actually recommend several uh, you know, the bench, uh, you know, good practice of how to address these inequality issues from a first point of view. The second question I will talk uh, later if I have more time. Okay, of course. Uh, Richard. Oh, goes automatically. Um, this is a very big topic to cover in six minutes. Uh, I have five points that I want to make. The first is a somewhat technical one uh, concerning measurement of poverty. It's become very fashionable to use something called the Gini coefficient to measure inequality. The Gini coefficient is actually a very clever uh, coefficient but it is a single number, and inequality is typically much more complicated than can be captured in a single number. Two countries may have the same Gini coefficient, uh, that is to say the same degree of inequality measured in that particular way, and yet be very, very different. Uh, for example, one may be traditional inequality by decile of income. The other may be a big urban-rural divide with uh, relatively equal incomes in the urban sector and in the, ur and in the rural sector, but enough of a rural sector so that the Gini coefficient is, uh, is uh, as high as in the first case. Uh, so just a warning, uh, beware of the measurements that we use. I was pleased that Maori did not rely on the Gini coefficient, but I've noticed it's become fashionable to do that. Second point. We live in very paradoxical times. It could be the case, logically, and it is almost the case empirically, that inequality could be rising in every country uh, and yet declining globally. How can that be? And the answer is really poor countries, big poor countries like China and India, are growing much more rapidly than uh, the rich countries are. So that if you take a global view, Inequality has actually been declining over the last 30 years, uh, even though, as I say, in most individual countries for which we have measurements, inequality has actually been rising. Which do we care more about? Well, we actually care about both. Uh, both are of interest and significance, uh, but it suggests we need some refinement as we think about uh, policy, what it is actually our objectives are. Third point. I've noticed a tendency in uh, public discourse to conflate inequality and poverty. And I want to make the point that those are quite different things. Uh, poverty, I'm talking about absolute poverty on, the, say, the World Bank measurement of $1.25 a day or $2 a day in purchasing power parity. I haven't encountered anyone who's in favor of poverty. Uh, poverty is something we all should want to eliminate uh, so that people have real choices in life and for their children in life. Inequality is a much more complicated phenomenon <clears throat> than poverty is, and uh, we should analytically uh, keep them separate. Uh, fourth point, it's a variant of what uh, Mr. Reed just said. Whenever there's a big change in the policy regime, in favor of greater growth, think of the uh, elimination of communism in Eastern Europe, 
20 odd years ago or the change, radical change in economic policy that took place in China. I think that a growth in inequality, uh, inevitable is a strong word, but I would say all but inevitable. Why is that? Because people, individuals are differently situated to take advantage of the opportunities that are now, by assumption, made available, which were not available before. They may be better, have more appropriate talent. They may have uh, better political connections. They may just be lucky to be in the right place at the right time. And so my expectation would be that uh, whenever you have a large change in policy regime uh, in favor of a more market-oriented system, that inequality will go up, not forever, uh, but for a period that could be measured in uh, a decade or, or more. And I think that's, uh, and that of course is especially the case if the level of equality was notionally much higher uh, in the initial condition as it was in the communist countries of Eastern Europe, for example. Now we all know that the reality was there was a tremendous amount of privilege in those countries under the communist regimes, but they were not captured by our normal measures of, uh, of inequality. And the final point I want to make is, um, uh, goes to our values. Uh, and I'm very much aware that different people have different values when it comes to inequality. There are some people who think that inequality per se is a bad thing. I am not such a person. Uh, I think that there are some perfectly legitimate reasons for inequality, and there are some quite illegitimate reasons for growth and inequality, and I actually want to distinguish between those two. Uh, in a, in a market-oriented system, we have celebrities of various kinds, whether they're movie stars, they're rock singers, they're opera singers, or they're very skilled uh, baseball players. Uh, they earn their high incomes in the sense that there are thousands running into millions of people who are willing to pay uh, to hear them or watch them. Uh, so they've earned their incomes. Uh, on the other hand, we have people who are in the same degree of income or wealth uh, who have gotten their wealth through political connections uh, in a regulatory system in which political favoritism which may or may not involve corruption in the narrow sense of the term, but political favoritism can lead to quite startling inequalities of uh, income. Inheritance can lead to quite startling inequalities of income. All of these things, it seems to me, are quite different reasons for inequality, and I, wa I actually want to know the reasons, and I want to frame my policy not around <laughs> inequality per se, but around the illegitimate sources of inequality. So for me, the reasons are all important. Thank you. Can we just drill down a little bit on this question of uh, legitimate and illegitimate reasons? Um, whatever the classification of the, of the reasons, you still have the negative fallout of inequality, the kinds of things we were just talking about uh, on social order, on inclusion. So are you suggesting that as long as you're okay with the balance between legitimate and illegitimate, or we've eliminated illegitimate reasons, that we just leave the negative fallout as is, or are you suggesting that policy should then turn to addressing the negative fallout? I think that uh, the attributing the negative fallout to inequality per se is probably an analytical mistake. I think that in many cases, I don't want to be generalize too much. In many cases, the negative fallout has to do with a sense of unfairness and illegitimacy rather than the presence of inequality per se. And uh, uh, so, I, again, I would want to make the distinction in analyzing what the consequences are. And I suspect we're attributing some things to inequality because that's what we have measurements for whose origins are actually in some sense deeper than inequality and go to the notion of fairness, which it gets back to the legitimacy issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Sakong? Can you have a Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> well, already uh, a lot has been uh, 
<clears throat> spoken on this uh, very big subject. Uh, even then, I would like to make a few general uh, remarks on the global income and wealth inequality. And then I may very briefly uh, touch on the Korean situation. As uh, previous uh, speakers have already pointed out, uh, the income inequality and income and wealth inequality uh, has been rising uh, throughout the world during the last three decades or so, uh, particularly in the advanced economies. I suppose uh, one can single out, or at least uh, the, uh, the identify some of underlying forces which uh, the, the contribute toward uh, worsening income the equality or income inequality. First of all, this market-based economic system itself has inherent, inherent tendency to uh, be bring about income inequality, but that income inequality may be called as, quote, deserving inequality, as the late uh, Nobel laureate uh, Gary Becker uh, alluded to. Even then, the, when inequality, as it is today, persistently increase at, and the, at the high, uh, higher level, then it may become not only social, political, and ethical problem for any society, but it can become economic problem as well. And <clears throat> the other factor, of course, is global, globalization, together with ever-deepening knowledge-based economy, reinforce, reinforces the systemic inequality uh, tendency. I emphasize this because globalization is not the main cause of inequality, rising inequality. My, the, the, that's the, the, the point I would like to make. And the, why then the inequality can become the gross inhibiting uh, factor. Of course, two economists uh, mentioned uh, some of the uh, aspect of this uh, issue uh, previously. But for example, if inequality affect productivity of the workforce of any nation, in one way or the other, for example, by blocking certain segment of workforce to the access to quality education or decent uh, health and Medicare uh, services. That would affect productivity and therefore it will affect the economic performance and growth. The worst thing is that it put inequality into vicious circle. And also it put in, in the intergenerational income inequity problem. So we have to deal with this for purely from economic point of view, not just ethical or social political. So that's what the, the point I would like to make. Now with regard to Korea, as uh, Chang Yong mentioned earlier, as a, Asia as a whole, uh, it is well known that <clears throat> the rapid growth period of 1960s and 70s and 80s, Korea's income distribution was much more favorable than any other developing countries, uh, the, but uh, since the early 1990s, the Korea's income distribution started to be worsened. Interestingly enough, immediately after the late 1990s Korean currency crisis or Asian financial crisis and the 2008 uh, global uh, the financial crisis, 
the income distribution in terms of uh, Gini coefficient uh, improved uh, for a while. However, the, the level of income inequity now is much higher than the level we had in the early 1990s. Again, I suppose you can think of many factors. Of course, the global factors such as uh, accelerating globalization with the, together with the deepening, ever deepening knowledge base economy and so forth will contribute. But I just want to uh, bring your attention to the two structural factors uh, uh, in, for Korea. One is educational uh, sector and the other one is the labor market structure. Now, educational sector and we, we all know that Korean households spend much more money, the most money for getting their children's private tutoring. So what it does is that those children with richer parents would get better tutoring, at quality tutoring, and that would contribute to worsening income distribution and the intergenerational income uh, inequity as well. So we have to, uh, so the, the improving the public schooling is a very, very important measure which is implied by this uh, fact. Another point I just want to uh, bring your attention is Korea's labor market structure. The, currently, the, the proportion of temporary and part-time workers as compared to permanent uh, the employees has been rather fast, the increasing rather fast. And the gap between the average wage gap between these two groups are getting wider. And as of now, I understand it's something like only the, the part-time and the temporary workers get only around 55% or 50% of the permanently uh, employed. And what makes this? Why employers, firms prefer to hire the temporary and part-time workers? Of course, this uh, economic structure, structural changes, of course, uh, affect that. But the, because of uh, usually talked about overprotection of permanent workers can affect this, and 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 the uh, uh, the currently the government is making every effort on uh, restructuring the labor market, and in the uh, uh, the wage gap between this uh, permanently employed and the and the. Uh, the temporarily employed as a widening. So uh, these are some of the contributing factors for Korea's rising trend of inequality. Did Thank I you. use my all six minutes already? You did. Yeah. Uh, but I want to just throw out one more statistic, which is very thought-provoking prov to this audience, to all us. That is about South Korea and North Korea. Of course, because of uh, data problem, I don't, I, I don't think you or anyone have seen the Gini coefficient for North Korea, but I just want to give you the simple fact that the North Korean <coughs> uh, boys aged between 13 and 18 are 13.5 centimeters shorter than South Korean peers. Girls, 8.3 centimeters shorter. Weight, again, is on for male. It's about 13.5 kilograms uh, difference. I wouldn't say female because South Korean girls won't have a diet. So, But in any case, so this... What I want to say is this, is that Korea is genetically and ethnically very, very homogeneous country for many, many years. But the country was divided after World War II, and one adopted market-based capitalistic system, which has 
downside, and the other one, the communist system. So what this shows is what the market economy can do to the well-being of the people as uh, so loudly and succinctly. So I just want to throw out these statistics. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I think we'll come back to the connection between inequality and human rights, and certainly your statistics are indicative of uh, the importance of that issue. Jean, would you like to? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'd like to make two points, one uh, on a general point and one on, on Europe. Um, I think most people in this room have spent part of their time explaining to other people that globalization was not uh, a major threat to, um, uh, to equality because uh, it could bring a reduction in global inequality, the point made by Richard, and at the same time that government had the means to address the domestic consequences of globalization and the distribution of income, they could use taxation to redistribute the gains from globalization. I think the first point was correct, and I, let me just uh, quote one statistic that was published by the ILO uh, a few days ago. Global wages last year, uh, in real terms, rose by 2%. If you exclude China, they rose by 1%. So half of the global increase in wages was due to China, which uh, indicates the magnitude of the phenomenon in terms of the emergence of a, of a global middle class. Nevertheless, I think uh, on, the, on the consequences uh, of globalization for within country inequality, several mistakes were, were made. I think we underestimated uh, largely uh, the correlation between globalization and tolerance to, to inequality. Um, indeed, in theory, uh, very open economy, like Nordic European uh, economies, they were both open economy and relatively egalitarian economies. So, so the idea was that the, the two go, could go together. But at the same time, the fact that the, the globalization created the option to walk out, an exit option for, for wealthy people, this had, had profound uh, consequences for the society's tolerance to, uh, to inequality. Second point is that the, uh, the issue of uh, tax avoidance has been uh, underestimated for a very long time. Basically, it was treated as a second-order phenomenon. Now, we have some statistics by researchers uh, saying that 8% uh, of total world household wealth is held in uh, tax havens. This is an enormous amount. Uh, if you just imagine that, you know, uh, most people won't put their savings in a tax haven. 8%, this is enormous, and this means that uh, the, the avoidance and the consequences in terms of uh, the ability of the tax system to redistribute wealth and, and income has been greatly diminished. Um, even if it were less important quantitatively, it's very important morally, and I think it has uh, undermined significantly the, the case for, for, for globalization. And finally, I think we have... Uh, underestimated the correlation between globalization and the type of technical progress and the technical progress that, uh, on its own, but also correlated with, uh, with uh, globalization. Perhaps it's a coincidence. Perhaps it's, a, it's more than a coincidence. Uh, has contributed to, to be biased uh, in the direction of more inequality. So I think that's uh, sort of the serious issues uh, we, we're discussing today. Now, let me turn to, to Europe. Um, Europe, in principle, the EU, uh, could have been in a very different position uh, because uh, the WTO, the IMF, the institutions that were not established with a mandate to address issues of uh, inequality or the, or the OECD. Now, we're seeing that these institutions are uh, increasingly concerned about the, the inequality, and paradoxically, the EU, which is a political institution, uh, with uh, a, a mandate uh, I mean, in, the, in, the, in the treaties of uh, improving the well-being of the, the whole of society, has proved relatively indifferent to these issues of, uh, of inequality. 
so we have shared value, we have political institution, we have accountability, and at the same time, uh, we seem to be relatively indifferent. Why is it so? Um, I think there, there are a number of, uh, of reasons. Uh, essentially, the, there is a constitutional reason, uh, which is that it was accepted from the start that the role of the EU was to deal with issues of inequalities across countries and across regions, but not across individuals. There was a sort of division of labor. Uh, uh, inequalities across individuals are the business of the member states, and the EU has nothing to do with it. That was the, the, the first reason. The second reason is that the EU has been extraordinarily weak on taxation matters. For reason that has to do with um, an alliance that has emerged between the, those in favor of tax sovereignty, so no discussion whatsoever on tax uh, coordination because it's a matter of national sovereignty, those in favor of tax competition who gain from uh, being, uh, being uh, you know, more lenient and playing even the role of a tax haven. We, we heard recently about the LuxLeaks, uh, about the, the treatment of multinationals. And, uh, and then those in favor of tax reduction who were using uh, tax competition as a way to reduce uh, taxes at home. And for these reasons, the EU has proved completely ineffective in this discussion about uh, inequality and the role of taxation. And we have this paradox that, uh, again, the OECD or the IMF seem to be more uh, concerned. I think this is uh, extraordinarily damaging politically for the EU. Also because the EU has been pushing for growth, has been pushing for integration with, as, a, uh, as an implicit assumption, the assumption that growth essentially lifts all boats. So everybody will benefit from, from growth. Now, the nature of growth, as it is now, is much more divisive. We know that growth does not lift all boats. We know that growth creates uh, wealth, uh, extraordinary wealth. So to be pushing for growth, to be pushing for integration without showing uh, concern about the distributional consequence of that, uh, I think is, is, is not a winning pr proposition in, in the time to come, and there is need for some deep changes in this respect. Thank you. Let me just come back to your question or your, your point about uh, tax avoidance. We've heard, obviously, a lot, and let's focus specifically for a moment on corporate tax. We've heard everyone from Margaret Hodges in the UK House of Commons to um, the US leadership, everybody's up in arms and saying that this is an ethical issue, not a legal issue. In other words, that corporations have a moral obligation to pay more taxes than um, the law requires. Where do you come out from the standpoint of inequality? Is, it, is the right answer, fix the tax law? Is the right answer, whatever the tax law, corporations do have a moral obligation to pay more? Um, it's not a moral issue. It's becoming a you know, major public finance issue. If you take the U.S., the effective tax on corporation has dropped over the last 15 years by 10 percentage points, two-thirds of which are apparently due to tax avoidance through the extensive use of tax havens. So it's becoming a major public finance issue for all countries, and I think that's why it's being addressed. It's being called a moral issue, though. But are, So is the right answer for you to fix the tax law or just to put the responsibility on corporations to pay more voluntarily? Oh, I think, uh, no, it has to be done through, you know, first of all, to bring in much more transparency uh, and, uh, and and fixing the, the, the tax law. I mean, the, I think the, the, you could speak about the, what the OECD uh, uh, is doing because uh, the OECD has been at the forefront, being pushed by the U.S., in fact, uh, by, uh, you know, creating more, more transparency and making sure that this uh, profit shifting uh, is not part of the, of the rules of the game. Tax competition in terms of, you know, having a better tax system, having a, offering a different combination of public services and taxes, that's part of the normal competition. But just profit shifting uh, to wherever the tax uh, law is more favorable uh, without a, 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 any economic basis behind it. That shouldn't be part of the normal rule of the game. Uh, can I comment on that? I, I, I think the direct answer to your question is it has to be done through law. You cannot expect corporations to pay taxes that they're not legally bound to pay. But two issues. One is the 
I'm speaking now of the United States, I assume there's comp comparable authority in inland revenue and other tax authorities. The IRS has lots of capacity for adjusting for transfer prices where corporations are avoiding taxes by through their transfer pricing. The IRS is systematically underfunded, uh, so it doesn't have the human resources in order to carry out what the authorities that it has. And the underfunding is supported by corporations in their lobbying of Congress. So this is actually quite a complicated issue. I think the technical issue is you cannot expect corporations to go beyond the law when it comes to paying taxes, but you can expect them to be more circumstant. And there I think the transparency is very important in their political position that they take on taxation, including tax enforcement of existing law. And, and what is also need is, needed is the international cooperation, which has been done uh, now um, at the OECD together with G20 uh, when it comes to these uh, multinational enterprises so that there won't be those cases where they are not paying taxes at all. Um, of course, they, they try to avoid that, that they are paying too much ta taxes, I mean, to, to, to many countries, but uh, in many cases uh, they have not been paying taxes at all, uh, so using uh, the current legislation uh, in, a, in, a, in a bad way. And another dimension is then this, that uh, what is needed is transparency, uh, and uh, that will come then via the automatic exchange of uh, uh, tax information, uh, which has been uh, done also uh, at, the, at the OECD, but of course uh, all the countries uh, has to then uh, agree and be part of, of the project. So I'd like now to come back to my question to Chang Yong on the technology. But before I do, um, inequality is not a standalone risk. It relates to a number of other major issues that we're seeing in the news. And so I'd like you all to think about um, one other issue that's of particular interest. For example, Ebola. Um, perhaps the sharing economy, so Uber, Airbnb, and, and these can be risks or opportunities, by the way. Um, as Thierry called it, the so-called Islamic State, human trafficking, or to pick up on some of the human rights uh, issues that uh, Dr. Sekong mentioned, but the relationship between inequality and one other issue. Um, and we'll come to each of you after. Chang Yong, you want to go back to the technology question first, please? Basically, technology, this is a real dilemma. You do not want to, you know, really, because of inequality concern, you do not want to really, you know, make the technology progress be slower, right? Because there's a lot of benefit uh, for the whole, you know, human society. So I think this is the issue of the ex ante income versus inequality versus ex post. If you look at the OECD countries' uh, Gini coefficient before taxation and uh, transfer, they are much higher than Asia. But after the correction of the transfer and taxation, they're much lower than uh, OECD, I mean, Asia. So in general, I think uh, we need a system which actually give a more incentive for the people to be innovative and the technical progress. But if something happens, I think uh, given uh, the finding that excess in inequality is bad, and also, as Jean mentioned, now maybe people's tolerance about inequality is much higher because of social network and other things. So for social cohesion is another dimension. So maybe we need uh, some kind of redistribute policy, which is consistent with uh, more encouragement for the technology progress and ex post e equality. Thank you. Would anybody like to take up an issue, either one that I mentioned or another that's of interest to you? I, I just would observe, it's an obvious point, but it's worth making. We've recognized this uh, particular trade-off for a long, long time. That's what patents and copyrights are all about. Uh, we confer on successful inventors or on successful writers, a temporary monopoly which raises their income as a result of their contribution. It is judged on average to society at large. And uh, so these dilemmas are not new. They've been around for uh, patents go back to the, I mean, it's in, actually in the US Constitution. It's an 18th century idea, uh, patents and copyrights. And we've grappled with them sometimes more successfully, sometimes less successfully. My, my own view is that the current American copyright law is totally preposterous and uh, much more than is required to uh, incentivize writers to write, and I'm a writer. Uh, 
but that it, it, so the copyright law in this case is protecting a particular business model of the music companies and the publishing houses. Uh, that's an illegitimate use of copyright. It's rent-seeking, and uh, but that uh, runs through politics in democratic society, and I say in non-democratic society as well. And those are the trade-offs that we have to make at a, at a practical level. Dr. Sikong. Yeah. Uh, from the supply side point of view, I think these technological changes would uh, call for drastic uh, uh, educational systemic reform and training and retraining, particularly since uh, the digital divide and the ability to utilize information makes the inequality uh, far worse than otherwise. And therefore, so I think it is time uh, for the, uh, all of us really give some thought this really four-year education system itself and the, how to we see educate lifelong learning, not just the lifelong learning, you know, taking the extensive the extent of the course during the evening, but I mean it should be really lifelong learning institutional set up. And then the, the academia and the, the industry should have very close cooperation or training and returning program and so forth. Because technological changes are a desirable thing, and so we should uh, the, take advantage of technological change, but to minimize the downside of it. Sean. Sure. Yeah, just to uh, emphasize this point, I think we, we all uh, wonder how to deal with the inequality coming from the extraordinary return on the innovation and the fact that uh, the technical progress has Im implied a multiplication of an ability of an individual with ideas to make a fortune out of these ideas. And that's, uh, that's for societies, that's a really difficult problem to deal with because you want the innovation, but you, I mean, you're, you're concerned about the consequences. Now, we should not forget that a large part of the problems we're dealing with are not those problems. They are problems having to do with basic education. They are problems having to do with the ability of the, the, the school system to correct, uh, I mean, to, 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 to offset or to, to, to correct inequalities of social background, of ethnic background, of spatial background, and uh, to promote social mobility. Uh, our systems uh, do not perform in many countries in the way they should be performing. And that's a major public responsibility. And whatever happens you know, in the course of your life in terms of you know, making a fortune or not because you're just a little bit brighter, uh, these issues remain and they remain fundamental and we are underperforming. I'd also actually like to challenge the notion that innovation is, is linked necessarily to technology or to something that is sellable and really question what kind of innovation could help this inequality problem that isn't just about another technological uh, breakthrough or, or another product. Um, and certainly we're seeing a lot now in the social enterprise area where there's innovation in how we're, for example, delivering services. Um, so uh, Chen Yong, and then we'll open it up to all of your questions and comments, please. I want to give you that example. You know, there are many so-called frugal innovation you know, for the you know, poor people. So innovation doesn't necessarily mean the you know, big things for the others. Thank you. I think there are uh, two, different, uh, two different inequalities. One is the inequalities between countries. And globalization, of course, contributing to that a lot. You cannot compare the situation in Africa to the situation in Europe. Globalization usually used by the rich and, by the, uh, and the good and the strong countries to use the sources of the poor countries without really paying them back enough. So it's part of the inequalities generally. There is, of course, inequality within the societies in every country, which depend on different uh, kinds, what kind of education the people have, what are the... Uh, this distribution of the money that coming from the economy, etc. On this, in my opinion, there is things that government can do. There are two, ta two uh, kinds of taxes. Income tax, which is a direct tax, and it is progressive tax, which means everybody pay according to his own uh, earning. You pay as much as you earn more, you have to pay more. As you actually, if you 
earn less. You don't have to pay. And even some, some countries like United States and Israel, there is even negative income tax, which means in order to uh, in order to encourage people to work and get more money, the government, instead of taking it from them tax, they paying them a grant if they're working in order to give them motivation to work. This is direct tax, which is much more justified and progressive. And there is indirect tax, which is the VAT tax, for example, which everybody pays the same. doesn't matter poor or rich, they pay the same taxes. I think the government can change the policy of taxes and raise the level of the income tax, of the direct tax, and reduce the level of the uh, indirect tax, like the VAT. In that case, you're helping, as a matter of fact, the poor people. Because if you're speaking about food, for example, if a poor man go to buy one, uh, let's say, a bread, he pay exactly the same price, including the tax, like the rich man is buying it. And if you want really to help poor people, or people who are weak economically, you have to change the a relation between income tax and the VAT tax, or other taxes which are indirect tax. So there is one that government can do. In, on your uh, last question, of course, things must be done by law, not by any voluntary of the companies to pay more than they have to pay. Most of them are not. If they do something, they do in order to have a, bad, a good image. We can encourage it by doing something else, except of putting laws of taxes, by encouraging, by, for example, creating a companies which make rating of what we call uh, company responsibilities or com corporation responsibilities, and to publish every year how much every corporation contribute to, uh, to responsibility, on the responsibility point yes, of view, most to society. Yes, most companies do have that. They have corporate social responsibility reports. And they have reports that can help people if they want to give over the tax, but the taxes should be done by law, not by voluntarily. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. En fait, je voudrais abonder dans le même sens. Je me suis longtemps posé la question et j'attendais que le débat aborde cette question. Alors, la première vision serait de se dire est-ce que la mondialisation accroît les inégalités Et je me suis posé la question si le véritable débat n'était pas la mondialisation face aux inégalités. Nous sommes dans un espace de préoccupation de relations internationales, de gouvernance. Nous avons tous, nous admettons tous assez facilement qu'il y a un certain nombre de questions maintenant qui ont pris une telle amplitude. Et nous sommes demandeurs de gouvernance mondiale. Ça, c'est une évidence. Et, et, et pour ce faire, pour euh, expliquer mon propos, je, je voudrais évoquer un cas particulier où j'ai été non seulement témoin observateur, c'est le dossier du Sahel. Le dossier du Sahel est maintenant une crise de type euh, de, de, de dimension sécuritaire. Euh, et, et moi, j'ai vu des partenaires qui souffraient de graves problèmes de famine, euh, de, de sécheresse, et, et qui étaient dans des systèmes absolument terribles et des organisations et gouvernementales et étatiques euh, incapables de, de gérer. À telle enceinte que l'espace le, a évolué pour que la capacité financière budgétaire des pays et qui vaille un peu au un dixième de, de ce qu'était le trafic de drogue qui s'était installé dans cet espace. Alors, ce que je veux dire, c'est que nous avons vu évoluer un dossier de famine qui est devenu un dossier sécuritaire. Cela veut dire que nous avons une préoccupation fondamentale sur les questions d'inégalité quand elles atteignent des degrés structurels comme ça, qu'elles menacent des régions et qu'elles se transforment tout de suite en menaces sécuritaires. Il est extrêmement difficile de convaincre. Par contre, je, moi, moi je, quand même, je reste relativement étonné. L'intégralité de notre capacité intellectuelle d'investigation et autres, quand elle est interpellée sur les questions financières ou la fluidité commerciale, on imagine un certain nombre de mécanismes institutionnels internationaux pour l'assurer, pour intervenir. La gouvernance, par le biais de la Banque mondiale, se préoccupe des conditionnalités politiques. On met en place un certain nombre de dispositifs. En face, aucun dispositif, aucun sens de la responsabilité. Bien mieux, pour l'intégralité de ces pays, notamment de la région, on, invente le con, on, on, on invoque le concept de la solidarité quand il s'agit de lutter contre le terrorisme ou l'immigration clandestine. Et lorsqu'il s'agit... Excuse me, so your, your point is that we need to be more focused on global governance mechanisms 
Oui, je, non seulement je parle bien sûr de, de ces approches, mmh. mais je parle de la notion pour abonder dans le même sens de l'intervention qui s'est faite av avant moi. On ne peut pas percevoir l'inégalité euh, tout simplement à l'intérieur des tissus nationaux ou du tissu d'une seule société. Ce que je veux dire, l'inégalité maintenant prend une autre amplitude de façon extrêmement plus importante. Et même dans la relation internationale et dans la vision, euh, le, 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 la solidarité contre le terrorisme, la solidarité contre l'immigration clandestine euh, doit avoir comme contrepartie une solidarité des approches sur des questions structurelles. La pauvreté, I... la santé, on commence à l'admettre sur la, sur, le, sur la question environnementale, il est temps qu'on l'admette sur les questions d'inégalité. Exactly, and that's precisely why I, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear your question, it's precisely why I asked the question about the relationship between inequality and human rights and Ebola, and human trafficking, and ISIL, and all of these, as you say, um, issues that cross national boundaries. So would anybody like to address that, or we'll go to another question? Yes. And just if we can please try to keep the um, interventions relatively succinct so we can give a maximum number of people an opportunity to speak because we're running out of time for this. Thank you. Um, thank you, dear speakers. Thank you for sharing with us. Very insightful. Given that the topic, the focus of this session is on globalization and inequality. So my question is, um, what's your opinion in general about the relation between globalization and inequality? For instance, many critics have argued, um, for instance, from McBride's report entitled One World, Many Voices in the 1970s to a 10 years away from British International Communication Corporation to more currently MIT report published in year 2007. On the one hand, the coverage of the uh, third world from the first world has been dramatically declined, either in terms of quality or in terms of content. On the other hand, the third world has much less space to define, present, and represent themselves since the 1970s. In all, in the situation, so what do you think about uh, regarding fighting inequality? What do you think about the uh, impact of globalization, it's more good or more harm. I'd like to, would you like to share your general opinion on this topic? Thank you. Richard, would you like to go and uh, then follow? Yeah, I, I think that question illustrates the complexity of this topic, uh, inequality. If one is talking about global inequality, then I think the answer is unambiguous and without any question globalization has reduced global inequality. Why? Because it permitted China to grow as rapidly as it did during the... Without globalization, without tying into the world market, the China, China could never have taken off as rapidly as it did. And as Jean's uh, one data point suggests, a large part of the global story is what's happened in China with over a billion people. Uh, a tremendous reduction of poverty, a tremendous increase of income of very low income people, and that has reduced global inequality. If you're talking about inequality in France and the impact of globalization on that, that's a different question altogether. So we have to refine what it is we're really, what, what's really bothering us. Actually, I'd like to uh, try to uh, answer these three questions which were raised uh, by the public uh, together. Uh, because I think we are all here trying to figure out what is the best recipe for every single country in tackling inequality. Uh, and uh, as you have already heard, there is no single recipe because every country has its own, own uh, recipe. It depends uh, so much on uh, the level of development of the, the country, which uh, measures should be uh, taken, and also how uh, uh, big is the uh, inequality. But what should be... Uh, um, in, in every case, uh, kind of uh, is as prerequisite uh, to, in, uh, to equality is that the country uh, is a, demo a democracy and also follows rule of law 
and is a secure state. That kind of uh, founds uh, the basis uh, for uh, equality. And then uh, comes uh, the policies uh, which governments uh, can implement when it comes to education system, uh, training system, uh, and, and other, uh, other poli policies like social uh, policy and, and uh, transfers uh, then uh, to uh, low income and, and poor uh, people. Well, during my brief remark, I purposely uh, referred to North Korea situation in comparison to South Korea. I don't think North Koreans worry much about the uh, risk of globalization. But what is the, the outcome? Uh, with the, per capita, the, um, the purchasing power parity base, North Korean per capita income is still below $2,000. South Korea is well over $30,000, 30, maybe $30,000, $35,000. And so what the, the made the difference was, by the way, as late as early 1960s, North Korea had twice as high per capita income as Korea, South Korea had. And so, uh, as I said, there's no uh, Gini coefficient, but I think you can guess the Gini coefficient there would be much worse than South Korea too, because uh, the dear leader, uh, previous leader, used to drink uh, thirty thousand dollars of the uh, French wine, so you can see what kind of income distribution they might have. So uh, the global South Korea, what South Korea did was, you know, they relied on globalization and market-based capitalistic system. So what we are here to discuss is how to the, the uh, 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 minimize the downside of the globalization and the, the some of the inherent tendency, uh, undesirable tendency. But uh, I don't think we are talking about any alternative because it's just so clear. And the two Korean cases really lab case. E you know, e economy cannot put into a lab situation, but to Korea's almost like a lab case. So this will illustrate. And also China too, I think you know, after this globalization, I said, what do you have? You made that effort to join this uh, Pascal Lamy's WTO. You made 10 years effort, and what do you achieve now? So we have to deal with the inequality, uh, which is as a challenge, but that does not prevent us uh, so we you know, go against the uh, globalization, I think. So. Yeah, if you um, if you look at uh, the the global income distribution across individuals, and you look at the way it has been transformed over the years, as Richard said, it's difficult to summarize it in one coefficient. But it's clear that you see the emergence of a of a global middle class. Uh, the the I mean, one definition is people who have between ten and a hundred dollars to to spend per day. And on that account, there were one, less than one billion uh, 20 years ago, most of which were in, the, in Europe and the U.S. Uh, now we, I think, are two and a half, and we'll be three and a half uh, in uh, 15 years. Uh, and this is a major, absolutely major transformation. Uh, so I think uh, in, in terms of the historical relevance, this dominates uh, probably everything. Shouldn't make us less, uh, more tolerant vis-a-vis -vis inequalities in our own countries. Uh, uh, there is no reason why we should be. Uh, so I think we should be addressing both, both dimensions. We should, we should praise this evolution, but at the same time uh, find ways to, to, to address the rise of inequality within countries. Now, this makes me, uh, I would like also to answer your point about taxation. Um, I mean, Direct taxation is a way, uh, obviously, to, uh, to redistribute. Um, it's not the only way, and you know we have complex tax systems because we need to use both direct taxes and indirect taxes and redistribution with, uh, uh, through spending as well as redistribution through, through taxation. So I think they, um, in general, I, I agree with you that uh, direct taxation has a major role to play, but it's by far not the only instrument we have. We are almost uh, running out of time, so I'm going to give you each about three minutes to uh, make any final remarks. 
if you could try to include in that sort of your highest priority policy initiative. Um, of course, anything else you'd like to add that you haven't had a chance to note? And if anybody's willing to take me up on my question about the relationship between inequality uh, and other global issues in the whole three minutes I'm giving you, please go ahead. Um, Chang Yong, would you like to start? Uh, I think I have talked too much, so I'll just address the last question you mentioned, Ebola and human trafficking, all these issues. My personal opinion is that those uh, problems can be addressed much better by reducing uh, you know, the poverty rather than inequality. So I think uh, uh, the poverty is much more important factors in those social problems. Thank you. Sean, would you like to go next? Yeah, perhaps uh, going back to the two dimensions I, I addressed, on, at the global level, I think we uh, should uh, put the emphasis on transparency, exchange of information, all what makes it possible for our uh, national uh, tax systems to operate in a, in a normal way. And in spite of the progress being made at the OECD level, I would say this is not a done deal, um, especially as there are not only the OECD countries in the world, there are other countries. And there are other countries which uh, may or may not participate in this exchange of information. And Wales is, uh, you know, extremely mobile, and uh, so this is this is an important uh, thing we may uh, we, we we need to to achieve. Again, I mean, the the idea of a, of a sort of global taxation, I think, it's not for the century, uh, although we are at the beginning of the century, perhaps not for the next decades, but. Um, uh, the transparency and the change of information, that's something that has started that should continue. Now, on Europe, uh, I think uh, uh, they, they need to, to, to go beyond. I think we, uh, I don't think we are we are at the stage of having uh, taxation of individuals, but I think the, the thinking on the way we should be evolving in the way uh, European policies should be addressing not only uh, integration uh, among nations and uh, um, regional policies, but also the consequences of this integration for, for individuals uh, and the sort of set of core principles upon which this integration is built. I think that's uh, on the agenda for, for now. Yes, actually, uh, I totally agree with uh, Jean when it comes to uh, this uh, BIPs uh, concerning multinational enterprises. Uh, the taxation and also automatic ex exchange of tax information, there's still a lot of work to be done and the implementation uh, is really uh, not yet there uh, and more countries are, are needed. Uh, but that really is a major step forward compared to the uh, present and, and previous uh, situation. But actually I would like to also answer the question concerning what effect the globalization has to inequality. And actually the OECD survey says that it has, it, that it has no direct uh, uh, effect, but of course very heavy indirect um, uh, effect uh, to um, inequality. But to, to conclude, I just uh, want to uh, actually reiterate that what I have earlier uh, said when it comes to uh, that, that what should be done um, in, when tackling in equality. So I really think that we should be able to provide uh, the people with better skills uh, that really is needed if we want to create more inclusive uh, growth. And then we have to be able to deliver quality uh, jobs. And actually, according to our uh, survey, it is possible to uh, create more uh, jobs and at the same time uh, improve the quality uh, of, of jobs, so there is no uh, trade-off uh, between the amount and the quality, um, according to, to our surveys. Thank you. Dr. Sakon? Just very brief points. Uh, I think we do agree on uh, the fact that the uh, appropriate measures, uh, redi redistributional measures, uh, measures and the social welfare policies are necessary, even from purely economic point of view. Uh, OECD studies and the IMF also uh, uh, the, uh, support that. 
and 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 so the question is how we design it, and the and, and also there are ways to uh, the design the package of redistributive policies measures and the social well, welfare uh, policies so that it can be growth enhancing rather than growth inhibiting, and the education is one. And the the last point is that uh, there are, there. Are, uh, many of uh, the uh, cross-country data which show that the inequality is inversely related to intergenerational uh, the mobility and social mobility. And so the, in, and from that perspective, what is important is uh, educational reform and the provide decent uh, medical and the health services to poor segments of society. Uh, <clears throat> two observations. One concerns educational reform. Uh, I'm an educator. It's hard to disagree with the desirability of improving the educational system. But I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which, as you can imagine, attaches high importance to education. And I think we, of all of the School districts in the United States, we probably spend more per capita, at least we're way up there per capita. And I would give, I would evaluate the success of the Cambridge public school system as a B minus. Uh, it's done some good work, but I, what I'm cautioning against is putting burdens on the school system which the school system cannot bear. We cannot require the school system to correct all of the ills in society unless you're prepared to take children away from parents at age one or one and a half and put them in institutional setups, uh, there's just a tremendous amount of inertia, intergenerational inertia, regardless of what the school system does. So that's just a cautionary remark. The other <coughs> remark I'd like to met, make, because it hasn't been mentioned except by me in passing, it has to do with inheritance. Um, uh, if we want to perpetuate a rentier class and increasing inequality over time, you allow low tax or tax-free inheritance to take place from one generation to another. Uh, Europe has settled this issue for right or wrong, but this is an important issue in rapidly growing countries. China faces it, Korea faces it, uh, where incomes have grown very rapidly in one generation and uh, that generation is still alive. Uh, what are we going to do about passing that wealth to the next generation. Do we want to create a generation of rentiers, people who don't have to work to make a living, uh, live off of their investment income or whatever, and that's another contribution to, uh, to inequality, which is a, a sensitive issue in any society, but one that I think needs to be faced. Thank you, and uh, please join me in thanking our distinguished panelists.